Okay, so I think I'll, I'll start off. Um, we might have a couple more people joining uh, in a little bit, but uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for our presentation today. Uh, so today, uh, this is uh, a presentation on the Statistics Canada General Social uh, Statistics Data. Um, it's brought to you from uh, the Alberta non for profit Data Strategy. Um, so this is a, a data strategy that's around bringing data and, and tools uh, and capacity to the non for profit uh, sector. Um, it's sponsored and funded by uh, PolicyWise for Children and Families, Edmonton Community Foundation, and the, the Government of Alberta. Uh, and has support from the Alberta non for profit Network. Today's presentation will actually be from the folks uh, here in the general social statistics area from Statistics Canada. So it's a really cool uh, chance to hear about how things are going, where things are coming, and how, how to work with this type of data. So uh, I'm really excited about today, and, and I'm, I'm really excited to have such a great group of individuals here uh, joining us for this session. Um, to start out, I'd like to, to start out with uh, a land acknowledgement. So basically, um, Policy Wives for Children and Families uh, is based in both Edmonton and Calgary. We acknowledge that the land on which we are located is Treaty 6 and 7 territory, a traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous peoples, uh, including the Gainai, the, ne the Nehewak, the Nitsitapi, the Metis, the Kana, the Siksika, Nakoda, uh, the Stony Nakoda, the Sutena, the Denes Luna, and the Anishinaabe, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our communities. We respect the treaty that was made, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Uh, as well, um, we're going to pass it off to uh, Statistics Canada for their land acknowledgement. Uh, but I also invite others to, to share their land acknowledgement in, in the chat uh, to acknowledge uh, where you're at right now. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Statistics Canada acknowledges that our offices located in Ottawa are on the traditional unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg Nation. Further, Statistics Canada respects and affirms the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land. We extend our respect to all First Nations people, Inuit and Métis, and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, so uh, before we get into things, just a couple more uh, things I'd like to, to let you know. So one thing that we have been doing as part of the data strategy is, is doing regular updates with different types of data sources, often Statistics Canada data. So just a, a quick advertisement. Uh, one that we recently released is actually on the Canadian survey on business conditions and the, uh, related to the, the conditions of community non-for-profits. Uh, in the first quarter of 2020. So this, this analysis, if you're interested, it's on our website under the data strategy area, uh, as well as many other related analyses. And it, it talks about recent organizational outlook, employee outlook, work arrangements, and comparisons to the, the private sector. So it's really one of those great ways to use uh, the Statistics Canada data to get a sense of that pulse check, how things are going uh, in the non-for-profit sector. As well, we're working on the second quarter right now, and we're excited to uh, report those in the upcoming dates. So as a last thing, I'd like to just uh, give a, a chance for a, a person from the Alberta Non-for-Profit Data Strategy Steering Committee, Robin here, our CEO from PolicyWise, to, to sort of introduce us before we move on into the presentation. Should be on, on mute. Thank you very much, Matt. So I'm Robin Blackadar, President and CEO of PolicyWise for Children and Families, also the co-chair of the Alberta Nonprofit Network um, uh, Data Strategy Steering Committee, and I co-chair that with Mike Grogan, who I hope may be here from Integral Org. Uh, the steering committee in, includes uh, organizations that are nonprofit capacity builders in Alberta, but also Imagine Canada, which we would say is a national group that's very committed to supporting the nonprofit sector. We also have membership from Stats Canada, as well as the funders that were mentioned. 
The steering committee um, has been meeting for a couple of years now. The focus has very much been about uh, data about the sector, but the strategy itself has been in place for at least four to five years in Alberta. And I know that across Canada, there's been a great call for improving the way uh, nonprofit uh, sector and charities um, collect data, use data, have access to data. And so we're very, very excited to have such a broad um, set of organizations that are working around the same agenda. And we hope that this continues, that this momentum, this partnership, and this uh, relationship that we've developed with Stats Canada extends across the country, uh, gets uh, grows a momentum that we've been all working hard on, I know for many years, to really coordinate our efforts and do what we can to improve uh, data capacity, not only at the level of being within an organization, but uh, that highest level within organizations that make the decisions that guide what we do as a sector. So thank you very, very much for, for being here with us today. And I hope it's a very successful event. I'm unfortunately going to have to go to another meeting. A uh, good thing about Zoom, I can just pop in and out. But I very much appreciate having a chance to welcome all of you today on behalf of the steering committee. Over to you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, now uh, we'll pass it on to uh, Statistics Canada to, to start our session in, uh, on the general social statistics data. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us today and uh, being able to provide you some more information on the uh, General Social Statistics Program. Uh, my name is Stacey Wan, and I'm uh, Chief of the General Social Statistics Program at Statistics Canada. Uh, today, the presentation will be in English, but the presentation is available in French. Um, as well, please feel free to answer to ask questions in the official language of your choice. Bonjour à tous, je m'appelle Stacey Wan et je suis chef du programme de la Statistique Sociale Générale à Statistique Canada. La présentation sera en anglais, uh, mais elle est disponible en français aussi. Um, également, vous voulez poser vos questions dans la langue officielle de votre choix. So I'm here today with my colleagues, uh, John, Clémence and Patrick, who will also uh, present with me. Uh, next slide, slide please. So uh, for today's presentation, I'm first going to start by providing an overview of uh, what we previously referred to as the General Social Survey, uh, discuss how this program has changed in recent years, as well as provide some information on data access and recent publications. Uh, John will then present on some alternative data collection methods that we're using, as well as provide information on uh, the Canadians at Work and Home theme. Uh, this will be followed by Clémence, who will um, provide an overview of the family theme, and then Patrick uh, will present on giving, volunteering, and participating. Uh, next slide, please, Clémence. I see. So the target um, population of the general social surveys were the pop was the population aged uh, 15 and over, living in the 10 provinces of uh, Canada, and excluding re full-time residents of institutions. The uh, theme on victimization, also known as uh, Canadian safety, also does include uh, persons living in the three territories. Uh, each cycle has approximately 20 to 25,000 um, completed interviews, um, but this can increase if there are over samples that are purchased. So, um, for example, um, the last uh, GSS cycle was on social identity, and we had about 38,000 uh, completed interviews um, because there's an oversample of six population groups designated as visible minorities. And this was possible through funding um, through. Canada's anti-racism strategy. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, going forward, uh, Statistics Canada has started kind of our disaggregated data action plan. And so it's expected that we will be able to increase our future samples of the, of the surveys so that we can um, be able to provide more granular data either for um, diverse population groups or, for, or by geography. Um, the general social survey has always been kind of at the forefront of innovation, um, and in fact, it was one of the first social surveys to offer an electronic questionnaire option to respondents in 2013. Starting in uh, 2018, all of our cycles are um, 
all starting in 2018, all of the cycles are now going out with an EQ option in a lot, in addition to having uh, telephone interviews available. And this is really to allow interview uh, respondents to have a little bit more flexibility about how and when they complete their interviews and to hopefully address some of the declining response rates that we've seen in recent years. Um, the GSS has also done um, a lot of linkage uh, projects in particular. Where um, the family cycle um, has had a, had an historical uh, linkage to the tax file, which goes back, I think, to the 1980s to about 2013, and we'll be adding the 2014 to 2020 tax years to that um, file over in, in this fall. As well, social identity, we just recently completed a, a linkage um, between the survey data um, with the CERB data, uh, historical tax records, and also immigration, the immigration um, database. Uh, and then in 2017, um, a modernization um, program kind of started um, to look at um, how we can make the general social survey um, address some of the uh, needs of our stakeholders, in particular related to the timeliness of data, the relevance of data, as well as to reduce um, response burden. Uh, next slide, please, Klamos. So this slide here is showing kind of the uh, uh, seven themes uh, that the that have been conducted for the general social survey, as well as our stakeholders for each theme. Um, so the GSS has been collecting data for almost um, 40 years now, and each year we have a different theme go out in the field, but then that theme doesn't get collected again until five to seven years later. And so the themes that we have been collecting information on are uh, time use, and time use is actually starting collection in mid-July, so just a couple weeks from now. The collection will um, continue for one year because there are seasonality effects with uh, this survey, so uh, collection will start July 2022 and end uh, July 2023. Uh, there's also Canadians at work at home, families, caregiving and care receiving, giving, volunteering and participating, victimization, also known as Canadian safety, and uh, then social identity. And social identity was our most recently released uh, cycle. The initial release was in September of 2021, and we updated the file in March with additional derived variables and um, variables that were obtained through linkages. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, we had kind of had this um, cycle where a, a theme would go out and then the, the data weren't collected for another five to seven years. And so as part of the modernization, we're really trying to move away from that so that we can provide more data um, in between uh, those uh, survey years. Um, and as you can see, we do have quite a number of uh, different stakeholders for all of the different themes. There's some stakeholders who are interested in all of the different cycles, and then there are some that are um, more interested in one specific uh, cycle. Uh, next slide, please, Klaus. Okay. Uh, so this slide here is just kind of showing, you know, what the general social statistics program is. Um, we're trying to get away from, you know, the data every five to seven years with only data coming from um, an in-depth general social survey. And so this is why it's more of a statistical um, program. Nevertheless, the objectives really uh, remain the same as they were under the general social survey, and that's to provide information on specific social policy issues of current and emerging interest, as well as to understand uh, changes in the living conditions of Canadians over time. And so um, to do that, uh, you know, we produce these um, analytical files that allow for kind of that in-depth analysis on a, on a given topic as well as to produce those indicators so that we can do kind of that high level um, measurement of, of trends. Um, and so to be able to kind of meet all of these objectives, rather than relying on that one survey that happens every five to seven years, which we will have to be able to get that in-depth analytical file that our stakeholders and partners really need for program and policy development, as well as research, we can use some of these alternative data collection methods that have recently started at Statistics Canada, um, such as the, um, we call it the Omnibus Survey, um, its official name is the Canadian Social Survey, as well as web panels, um, which the most recent iteration is the Portrait of Canadian Society, as well as um, crowdsourcing, and John will provide um, more information on this in the next section. 
Um, but as I mentioned, we're also looking at using more administrative data for, for linkages. In some cases, it's to supplement uh, survey data. And in other cases, we can actually use some administrative data to, um, to do some data replacement. It's a little bit more challenging with, with the general social survey because a lot of it's about um, perceptions, for example, and experiences, which aren't available in administrative data. But there are some types of data, and one in particular is the um, work history module that used to be collected on the family cycle. Um, we knew that there were some data quality issues with that because, uh, because of recall, respondent recall. In many cases, some of this was decades later, and it's likely difficult for people to remember some specifics about how many hours they worked and that type of thing. Uh, so we're looking at the longitudinal worker file, which is an administrative database that Statistics Canada has to be able to do some data replacement for there. Um, we're probably likely to get some better quality data and at the same time reduce the burden on respondents by reducing the length of the survey. Um, as well, uh, modeling is also something that um, we have been doing. Um, this affects time use in particular. Um, the time use survey feeds the system of national accounts on, for their satellite account on the value of unpaid work. And they would like to have this data annually, but the survey only goes out every five to seven years. So um, we're developing modeling methods to be able to produce um, estimates in between the, the survey years so that the uh, national account can be updated. Um, you know, data disaggregation has always been a big request from our stakeholders and data users. Everybody would like to have more granular data, whether it be for geography or, or um, diverse population groups. Um, and now, as I mentioned, um, with the disaggregated data action plan, we do have an opportunity to increase those um, um, some of the sample sizes and do some oversamples for particular groups um, so that we can produce that more granular data. The time use survey is going to be um, trying to produce some estimates for um, urban rural um, because we do know that uh, time use differs whether somebody lives in an urban center, for example, or, or a rural area. Um, and as I had mentioned, social identity in 2020 had the oversample of six racialized groups. Um, Finally, uh, we do have a strong governance to uh, kind of oversee the program. We do um, uh, work with the Social Conditions Advisory Committee as well as the GSF during committee to ensure um, that what we're producing is relevant to our stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. So the general uh, social statistics program provides um, data to a number of different indicator uh, frameworks at Statistics Canada. Uh, these, this is the quality of life uh, framework, the social framework, the gender results framework, and the sustainable development goals. And so indicators come from actually all of most of the different surveys and they kind of fall within these four um, broad subject matter areas. Uh, all of these indicator frameworks and, um, and tables and analytical articles that support those frameworks are available on the Statistics Canada website. And also coming soon, I believe there will also be some data visualization tools for, for the frameworks. Uh, I think the most recent release was the Social Inclusion Framework, um, which released uh, a number of data tables in May. And the Social Identity Cycle did provide uh, a number of tables um, for that framework. And those tables have a fair amount of date of disaggregation and some intersectional uh, analysis within the tables. So they're, um, we were able to take advantage of that over sample from social identity. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, how we kind of disseminate our information and make the data available um, to data users, after a release, we will have kind of a number of articles and infographics released on the Statistics Canada website. As well, um, we also produce uh, the data tables that was previously known as CANSOM, now they're, they're CODER. Um, and also uh, we release the microdata files through the research data centers, as well as there's the real-time remote access for most of the cycles as well. Um, we also produce the public use microdata files for all of the GSS themes. Um, these are, you know, they're a little bit different than the microdata file because a lot of the um, answers can be grouped or capped, for example, so that we can ensure confidentiality. Uh, recently, though, all of the pumps are now available online, so you don't actually need to go through our client services to request access 
to a pump, uh, you can just go to the Stats Canada website and, and download the file directly from there. And then finally, um, there are uh, there is an option to get um, custom tables produced, um, and that's through cost recovery. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, and so this last slide of mine actually is just showing some of the analytical articles or infographics that were produced over um, the last year by the General Social Statistics um, Program team. Um, so that's it for my section. Um, before we move on to John, who will present the alternative um, uh, data collection methods, as well as Canadians at work and home. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, I will continue to uh, provide you with an overview of some of the uh, modernization the initiatives that the General Social Statistics Program is part of. Uh, next slide, please. So as Stacey mentioned, we'll try to find ways to, to collect and release data in a more timely fashion, and also looking at ways to fill in the, the data gaps. So uh, here I'm going to give you an overview of the social data integration platform collections tools, and there are four tools. Uh, for those uh, urgent need for timely data and also to to collect information on, on the difficult to reach population, we are using the crowdsourcing uh, uh, tools. So that will be a, a electronic questionnaire, uh, five to 10 minutes content, and it's quick to process. And it's also, it's like uh, we are using our content and prom promoting and call for volunteers to go to the second website and then be to participate in the, uh, in the crowdsourcing. Uh, the limitation is uh, because it's a crowdsourcing a different methodology than the sort of like a traditional survey, uh, the inference to population uh, is not possible. The other collection tools that uh, GSS program is is uh, is a part of is play a more a more major role is the omnibus, which is also known as the Canadian Social Survey, which is a electronic questionnaire ap application and have uh, interview uh, electronic questionnaire follow-up. It's about six weeks of collections. Uh, sample size is about 20,000. Uh, it has 70 questions, including uh, the socio-demographic questions. It takes about 20 to 25 minutes. We try to limit this, uh, don't going too long. And the advantage of this uh, omnibus is we can pull the quarters uh, different ways, waves, for data disaggregations uh, later on. And the final file will be available six to eight weeks after collection. I'm going to share with you a little bit more on those omnibus uh, contents and the different waves uh, later on in the subsequent slides. Another two is the web panel, which is EQ only, uh, one week collection period. The last one, uh, uh, GSS is part of, uh, we have a smaller sample size, about 8,000 people, which is uh, selected from the uh, social identity survey. And it takes about 10 minutes with 15 to 20 questions. The advantage of this approach is uh, we are using this, the sample from the social identity. So the standard demographics questions or, or the data already collected. So we can limit the questions to 15, 20 questions of interest. And the final file is also available within six to eight weeks after collections. Uh, the other two, the last one that we are involved in is the called, uh, we call it data disaggregation action plan, the, the, the diverse panel, which is also in a EQ format. Uh, it will take six to 12 weeks uh, of collection, that's the planning, and also depending on the waves. Uh, the sample size is about 60,000 to 80,000 uh, with 20 questions on content. And the first way will also include 20 questions on demographics. Uh, the focus of this diverse panel is we're going to do over sampling of population groups designated as visible minority. Hence, it will allow us to do uh, more in-depth analysis for uh, disaggregations. And this, the frame, the sample frame is coming from census, 2021 census. So the other advantage is that uh, the census uh, variables will also be available for our analysis. Uh, next slide, please.
uh, I would like to go through a little bit more detail with the Omnibus the Canadian Social Surveys. Uh, as of now, there are eight waves of uh, Omnibus uh, either being conducted or is in the process of uh, development. So for all the waves of the uh, Omnibus, uh, it contains sort of like a set of standard demographic content you see at the top. So that include age, gender, uh, information on immigration or so citizenships, uh, indigenous identity, uh, long-term conditions, sexual orientation, uh, education related questions, uh, labor force related questions, language and population group. And each wave uh, has a different uh, focus on the, uh, on the content. Uh, the content is mainly coming from a, a a, a few uh, subject matter divisions uh, within that can. Uh, GSS is one of the major contributor of content from wave one to wave six. Uh, you can also see here the quality of life team. It's also, also another major content provider uh, to the uh, Omnibus survey. I'll give you some examples, some of the GSS content is being used in this uh, Omnibus survey. For example, for wave one, three, and four, uh, we ask questions on intention to have children during pandemic. For wave two, we have questions on perceptions of time, use of technology. For wave three and four, we have life change since the start of pandemic. For wave five, we have questions on trust in people and also confidence in institutions. For uh, next slide, please. For wave six, we have questions on caregiving, especially on paid and unpaid care work. So uh, this is some of the examples that uh, the, the GSS uh, program or thematic surveys questions are being used in, in this uh, alternate collection tools so that we can produce uh, up-to-date uh, estimate or indicators to, to meet the needs of the data user. Uh, next slide, please. So here is a little update on the uh, status of those uh, projects. For Omnibus, Wave 1 and Wave 4 already released in the last two years. For Wave 5 on well-being and shared values and trust, uh, collection already started and we are in the process of processing and is scheduled to be released on August 19 for the Wave 5. And Wave 6 on well-being and caregiving, uh, collection will start soon in mid-July. Uh, it's on a, on a similar approach, uh, uh, there's a Northern Omnibus survey is in development and is, is scheduled to start collection uh, this fall. And the focus is in the North, so in the territories. And for the web panel, wave one to three, uh, the data has been released. And the latest one is the wave three on social impacts on inflation. It's just released a couple of weeks ago on June 9th. And the data is available on the StackCan website. Uh, the last one I would like to go through with you is the survey series on the people and their community. So which is the desegregated action plan uh, is the diverse panel. Uh, next slide, please. So the survey series on people and their communities, uh, the objectives of this, diverse panel is to allow us to, to conduct comparison between visible minority groups and also with non-visible minority population. And also to aim to allow us to generate uh, descriptive statistics of the visible minority groups and focusing on intersectionality. And the domain of interest of the uh, sampling strategy is focusing on the following domain, uh, visible minority groups, the seven most populous groups, gender, uh, immigration, so it would be between recent immigrants and established immigrants, uh, education, uh, age group, and geography. Uh, and for the first wave, the first panel, uh, we are proposing the contact in the subsequent uh, topics, uh, participation in groups, trust in belonging, so the sense of belonging to your communities and to Canada, and also the confidence in institutions. So, that's the, uh, that's the overview for the uh, modernization initiatives uh, uh, the General Social Statistics Program is part of. And the following three slides, I'm going to give you a quick overview on 
on the thematic surface on Canadians at work and at home. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, thematic survey on Canadian at work and at home, uh, the last iteration was conducted in August to December 2016. And the objectives of this survey is to identify lifestyle behavior in Canada that impact health and well-being of Canadians. And also provide data on the social aspects of work life and the relationship between work and the home life. And uh, the aim is to identify trends or issues in Canadian society. The target population is for those age 15 and over uh, living in the 10 provinces. The sample size last time is approximately 40,000. Uh, the collection mode, uh, the last cycle before 2000, in 2016 is EQ and CATI, but moving forward, it will be a electronic questionnaire or followed up by the uh, interview assisted electronic questionnaire collection method. And some of the content from the Canadians at work and at home is actually uh, used in the Canadian social survey, the omnibus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the survey content of, of the Canadians at work and at home can be sort of like a group into four major themes. The first one is life at work. So we ask questions on the workload, work distribution, work ethic, uh, job satisfaction, uh, skills, training, job security, uh, any uh, compensation on benefits in your work, and also uh, work pace uh, relationships with your colleagues. Uh, the other uh, topics is life at home. So we ask about questions about uh, participation in sports, uh, participation in cultural activities or participation in organization, also use of technology, and also uh, eating habits and nutrition. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the survey also touched on work-life balance. So we asked questions about uh, satisfaction with the quantity and the quality of time you spend together with your family, and also divisions of chores within the household, and also balancing work-home responsibility. The last major topic uh, of the survey content is the health, well-being, and resilience. So we asked questions on your self-weighted health, uh, your satisfaction with life, uh, stress, uh, life opportunities, and life aspiration and outlook and resilience. And also at the end, we, we ask the uh, this questions on the disability screening questions. So that's sort of like the overview of the uh, content that is uh, included into the Canadians Act Work and at Home Survey. Thank you. I'll let my colleagues, uh, Clemence, continue with the family survey. Uh, sorry, John, uh, there was yes. one question. Oh, okay, uh, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, which uh, maybe you could address because it seems to be related to what you just talked about um, from okay. Aswan in the chat. And and also, Aline has another one that may be related to your uh, what you just chatted about. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. Uh... So there was one question about um, collecting uh, gender and race related data. Um, so in terms of a social identity where we did have the large oversample of the uh, racialized groups, we did notice a, a couple of, um, of uh, issues. Language was definitely a, a big one. Uh, right now, our um, surveys for social identity was only in English and French. And so I think uh, one of the lessons learned from that is that we do need to look at making um, the survey available in other languages because that does seem to be a barrier to um, participation. Um, John and his team had actually done some qualitative testing with non-responders to the uh, social identity survey. And uh, we found the same thing that even recruiting for qualitative testing was challenging um, given um, the language barriers. Um, another um, issue too was that uh, social identity was collected pretty much entirely during the pandemic and because of that a lot of the Stats Canada interviewers were moved uh, to do contact tracing, um, which meant that there was less interviewers available to do uh, telephone interviews with people and we did notice that there were some um, groups, um, in particular those uh, with low income or, or low education that were 
less likely to complete by um, EQ. And so we know that um, as part of the desegregated data action plan, we, um, you know, having just an EQ option is going to miss um, some groups of uh, respondents. And so that we do need to make sure that we have a telephone option available. Um, in terms of gender, we haven't, um, we never, we haven't noticed anything yet uh, per se, but um, those are some of uh, what we did find uh, for related to some of the racialized groups. John, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that answer. Uh, no, I think that's about it. Uh, for the collection method, probably I can add, is there something for us to consider when we work with our collection uh, divisions within that can to make sure that to, or to, to explore ways to make sure that if people uh, have some language barrier that we will be able to, to address that issues and hopefully that uh, we can help uh, to make sure that we can collect the data for those uh, uh, visible minority groups. Uh, and then I noticed uh, the next uh, question about the sampling process in surveys that use crowdsourced data. So actually, um, the crowdsourcing don't doesn't use sampling at all, and so that's why it's not representative. So what we do is the questionnaire is put on the Stats Canada uh, website, and you know, kind of that secure portal that we use, um, and everything's kind of done by. Um, you know, social media and working with um, partner organizations and stakeholders and community groups to really get the word out um, that we're collecting information on that. Um, but it's because we don't have that sample file um, that we're not able to make inferences to the general um, Canadian population. So it's really through kind of a snowball type technique of uh, reaching uh, people who would like to participate. And so we actually don't call it a survey and we don't call it respondents, it's uh, participants and a, and a crowdsource because it is quite different from um, the surveys um, where the data are representative. And the next question is about asking about the data on work satisfaction uh, desegregated by industry. So I'm thinking you're asking the the data on the Canadians at work and at home. Uh, I don't have the information right now, but I do believe the, the Knicks and Knocks are asked in the survey. Uh, but at that early stage of that cycle, I am not sure that uh, if you mean the desegregation is by visible minority group, I don't think there's any oversampling at the visible minority group uh, at, that, at that cycle. So or if you are looking at the, the diverse panel uh, for this particular information. I think um, it, I could be wrong, but I'm just wondering if they're going to look at work satisfaction disaggregated by the industry in which people live, uh, people work. I would have to check and see if the NAICS are, are collected on, uh, on the, um, CSS, if that's the survey vehicle you're, you're wondering about. Okay, so we will continue with the family survey. Uh, my name is Clemence and I will give a quick overview of the family survey. The family survey is one of the General Social SASI program survey, and it's conducted to better understand how demographic changes have affected the composition of households and families, and the number and types of transition experienced by families. The survey is special because it collects uh, not only cross-sectional uh, indicator, but also a series of questions on the timing of life course events. And uh, this type of data is difficult to obtain by, uh, from administrative that data. That is why the family survey is a special survey. To date, so there have been six uh, family cycles. The last one was in 2017. And uh, it was conducted by CATI, a computer assisted telephone interview. For the next cycle, it will have an uh, electronic questionnaire for family survey. The interview length on average between 45 minutes to one hour. 
and the data were collected over 10 months from Canadian age 15 and older in private households in the 10 provinces. In 2017, the final sample was uh, around 20,000 respondents with a response rate of uh, 52.4%. Okay. So the major characteristic of family survey is that it collects biographical information. So events and when these were experienced are collected in order to measure the diversity of family situation and the plurality of uh, different uh, family in, ca in Canada. The survey interview a person about his parents, his family life course, and other events and characteristics. So while the family survey concerns many aspects of family life, it cannot use to derive the number of children in Canada or the number of union in, in Canada. It can only provide estimates of the number of Canadians who are parents or the number of Canadians who are currently married or in a common law relationship. Uh, okay. The uh, main topics of the family survey, so we have uh, content on parent history, so like childhood characteristic of parents, on uh, household living. We also have content on union trajectories, on fertility history, on fertility intention, and uh, uh, some uh, question on the characteristic of the respondent and his current spouse or partner. In 2024, we will have uh, the next cycle of a family survey. Actually, we are working on the questionnaire. Uh, qualitative testing will be done by the end of uh, this summer. And in the coming year, we will work on application development so that collection can start by the beginning of uh, 2024. In general, we can say that uh, uh, data from family survey can be used to help uh, policy makers and researchers. And concerning policy making, our data can help to understand, for example, uh, child care use and their planning, assessing uh, specific needs of family, uh, of, of complex uh, family. On the research side, they are used, for example, to analyze family complexity, uh, gender division of household tasks and fertility, fertility intention, and many other subjects related to family. On our side, we published also uh, over the past year infographic and studies with uh, 2017 data. Our last publication was about uh, contact with children after divorce or separation. We also published lastly an infographic on parental leave in Canada. And uh, all these uh, studies can be found on Satsi Canada website. So that is uh, all about family survey. Uh, if you have any question, I'll be happy to, to answer. Thank you. Oui, alors, oui, oui c'est donc euh, la, la, la présentation de giving, volunteering and participating. OK, Patrick, c'est ça? Patrick, c'est toi? Oui, c'est moi. OK, cool. <rire> Alors, tout le monde m'entend de là-bas? Euh... Oui, je pense bien. OK, parce que j'ai eu des problèmes. I had pro uh, technical problems uh, with, with Zoom, so I actually had to uh, come in via the phone option. So I just want to make sure that uh, people can hear me. I can hear you, Patrick. OK, parfait. Alors, euh, bonjour, Ai Kwe, et bienvenue à cette présentation sur l'enquête euh, du don, le bénévolat et la participation. My name is Patrick Fournier-Savard. I've been involved with the GVP survey since uh, the fall of 2013. 
The presentation will be in English, uh, but feel free, of course, to ask uh, questions in the language of your choice. So we can start with the first slide um, entitled Context. Um, so some of you may uh, know uh, GVP as being NSGVP uh, or CSGVP or GSSGVP. And as of now, uh, GVP. So that survey actually uh, began its is, is history on, uh, in 1997. Um, so it's been around for a while. Um, the last collection was in 2018. Uh, collection happened during the fall, September uh, through uh, December. Like many other social surveys at TATAN, the target population are persons 15 plus in the 10 provinces. Uh, sample file a bit lower than others. Uh, the final analytical file has 16, uh, just above 16,000 respondents. And that is a bit because of uh, the rejected uh, respondent. I'll come back to that in a few moments. Um, so the, in 2018, the GVP under, uh, went under made a major redesign uh, for many uh, reasons. Of course, the internet option now uh, being offered to Canadians was one of the, the, the aspects of the redesign. Uh, but other uh, aspects uh, concern a better coverage of informal um, volunteering and also uh, other uh, amendments of that sort. I'll come back to that uh, as well. So yes, uh, with, with a collection in 2018, it means that the latest file is pre-COVID, but a, an important baseline um, of information and, and uh, extremely well positioned with the intention in 2023 to go out again for the eighth time and propose a lecture pre-post uh, pandemic. So that is uh, a bit of the context information I can provide uh, today. I've briefly touched on the rejective sampling approach. I'll just briefly touch on it for data users out there who, who might be interested. Uh, because of the potential difficulties in reaching volunteers uh, as a result of their uh, low prevalence in the population, uh, there's an approach called rejective sampling, um, and it's been part for decades uh, of the survey sample design. Rejective sampling works by rejecting a certain portion of the non-volunteers population with a given probability. That probability varies by province, but uh, in average, it's 30% it's nationally who are rejected. And this is to actually allow more time, more resources dedicated to uh, our population of interest, and that is volunteers. Despite the benefits, uh, operational benefits of this approach, there is one downside to that, and it's that this uh, rejective sampling strategy tends to increase a little bit variant in certain domains of estimation. So for people who actually are interested in drilling down at the CMA, CA level, you will find rapidly the limits of uh, certain estimation because of that rejective sampling. Having said that, it is possible for certain large CMA to provide volunteering rates and so on and so forth. So if we should change slide, you'll see, um, the, our major stakeholders and partners. So GVP's content has been developed through the years through consultations with these guys that you have on that slide, some governmental, some from the nonprofit sector that you probably know, Imagine Canada, Volunteer Canada, very important partners, and also from the academic side with Ottawa U. Then basically, the picture you have in front of you is the GVP Steering Committee membership. So next slide, s'il vous plaît. So I was talking about a redesign, significant redesign in 2018 for the survey on giving, volunteering, and participating. Uh, but, but there's actually two item, items that stand out, in my opinion. Um, so the GVP survey now includes a better coverage of informal volunteering by better distinguishing direct help to people 
as well as community improvements on one's own, and that is activities not on behalf of a group or an organization. So that's an important component that is new uh, and that is uh, permits uh, the 2018 survey. Other amendments were made to ensure compa compatibility with the international definition of volunteering in accordance with the 19th International Conference of Labor Statisticians. Namely, these amendments uh, cover uh, better mandatory or required volunteering, better cover employer-supported volunteering, and better cover the beneficiaries. Uh, by beneficiaries, I'm talking about if the help that you give directly to someone outside your household, of course, is family related or not. So that is also a nuance that the 2018 can actually uh, permit. And these nuances are important to actually tap in that international um, definition. Next slide, GVP input and dependencies. Uh, GVP is known for uh, the four the, we call them the four big ones. And, and, and of course, they are the rates of volunteering and donating and the amounts, time and money. But GVP does more than that. It actually is uh, the, the unique strength of GVP is the ability to associate this information with different nonprofit sectors. And this added value is not found in other national replacement data source. As mentioned earlier, um, it will now be compatible with the international definition from the ICLF. The GVP survey also provides data to the nonprofit institution serving household sector account. Uh, why this is important is because it helps us understand the full scope of the economic contribution of, of these volunteers. Uh, of course, the, G, the GSS GVP data uh, is not only of importance for the government, uh, it, it is also uh, important for the nonprofit sector for um, service decisions, uh, recruitment strategies, and, and, and other uh, decision making. And as such, uh, every year, data requests and table are ordered annually from StatCan uh, by the nonprofit organization. And the pump, uh, uh, as Stacy was, was talking about uh, earlier, the public use micro data file is offered and uh, for free uh, to whomever uh, requests it. We can go to the next slide. Very rapidly, uh, GVP is not just one survey. It's actually two surveys, uh, one on the vol volunteering side of things and, and one on the charitable giving side. Uh, under the volunteering, as you might um, uh, guess, of course, time is spent on the formal aspect and on the informal aspect, which is subdivided in a direct help to people and uh, as well the community uh, component. Um, for the giving, a bit the same thing, financial giving, uh, a bit the formal aspect of it uh, by solicitation method, by sector et compagnie, but also uh, in terms of other giving, what you actually give to directly to people. Um, it could be money, it could be food, charity, uh, uh, toys. In both of these surveys, which is one survey, we also take time uh, uh, to ask questions on your experience, barriers, and the motivations uh, for non-volunteers, non-givers, volunteers, and givers, uh, so that's a huge source of information. And as like other surveys, we have other characteristics that are collected, um, uh, in indigenous uh, identifier, health and subjective well-being, length of time, uh, religiosity, the disability screening question. So I will not name all of them, but uh, there are other sociodemographic out there that uh, Give more, more, more richness to the content. So, if we go to the next slide, uh, these the following slides actually come uh, from the most recent publication on volunteering, and it was named. It is still named formal and informal contributions of Canadians in 2018. It was released 
Give me, give me a take 2021. Uh, now, because I will just provide a few snapshots, I invite everybody who wants to learn more about that publication to go online. The hyperlink is at the end of this presentation. So as you can see on this slide, uh, the publication, the analysis, um, uses a, general, a generational lens uh, to provide a first comprehensive overview of aspects that were not well documented or as well documented before. Uh, so, as you can see, in 2018, we we had an estimated number of Canadians, 12.7 million Canadian Canadian engaged in formal uh, volunteering. Uh, but things that are were less known or or, or less documented, uh, we have one example. Here is the last bullet point concerning mandatory unpaid work. Often, uh, I participation rates observed with youth were often uh, shortly explained by required volunteering for high school certification. But these 2018 numbers actually show a more nuanced uh, reality. Now, the next slide um, is actually, as I mentioned earlier, showing one of the unique strengths of GVP, and that is to associate volunteering uh, contribution to different sectors and activities. Uh, so the first slide, of course, shows that uh, hospitals, uh, the following organization types uh, as hospitals, religious organizations, sports, recreation, arts, culture, uh, are actually receiving the most uh, average hours. And the next slide is basically the same idea, but uh, um, focusing on the activities, not the organization, and this time focusing on participation rate rather than than ours and, and as an example of one data point you can see that organizing and supervising events were the most commonly reported formal uh, volunteer activities if we continue with the next slide uh, on informal volunteering we can see again uh, information concerning amounts rates um, and, and billion of hours that that informal volunteering represents. Um, but one of the interesting aspects that the 20, 2018 redesign permits is, uh, I guess, one example that expresses that is the last bullet against where 62% of all hours given to help others directly went to tasks for relatives outside the household, and that is interesting for many reasons, but one for sure concerns the volunteering definitions that are out there. Some include hours dedicated to relatives outside the household, and some exclude them, such as the international definition. So as you can see, including or not these hours that are devoted to relatives outside the household can make a big difference. And that is, again, one of the uh, added value permitted by the, the, the redesign. Continuing on informal uh, volunteering, but this time with the subcomponent of helping others directly, I will go very briefly over them just to, to show you uh, the relative importance of some of these activities that uh, make up the screeners or the screening questions. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the housework and home maintenance is one of the big uh, activities out there and how it can fluctuate through the generations. Um, others activities that are considered within the uh, survey uh, are shopping, driving to store or appointments, paperwork, health related, or personal care, teaching, or tutoring. And if we go to the next slide, we now see the similar information, but this time for the other subcomponent sub of, of informal volunteering, which is improving community directly. Uh, very rapidly, you can see that disseminated, disseminating information is a big one and largely uh, dominated by a uh, younger generation. And you can have also a little snippet of the others' activities that are considered within that domain, which are uh, maintaining a park or public space, participated in public meetings, 
coordinated a group or event and develop an economic or social project. So if we go to the next slide, um, as you probably already know, in 2018, the formal volunteering rate was 41%. And for years and decades, that was the rate that you were uh, probably uh, using uh, when doing your own analysis um, or thinking process. But when considering all aspects of volunteering, the overall rate in 2018 was 79% when informal and formal aspects are brought together. And the survey redesign from 2018 permits us now to classify volunteers in the following exclusive categories that you see by the second last bullet point on that slide and the uh, volunteer um, doing it informally exclusively is uh, the largest uh, component followed by the combination of formal and informal at 35 and only six percent of Canadians are actually doing it formally only and the next slide is a bit again using the same concept but this time uh, at the provincial level and as uh, we can observe, some provincial differences uh, in informal or formal volunteering actually fade out or decrease when considering overall uh, volunteering. And this is the case, uh, for example, the two last bullet points on this slide with the Quebec, Quebec uh, where Quebec had the highest rate of informal volunteering exclusively. So in total, uh, when you consider all volunteer overlapping or not with, with each other, uh, it gives us another type of texture on how people actually engage. So the next slide is uh, very briefly the timelines that we're looking at uh, in the short uh, run. So currently in the consultation process for the 2023 um, survey, content development will happen through the fall. Uh, and uh, until summer 2023, working on that EQ application to be ready for 2023. The last slide is, I believe, I cannot see it because I'm only on the phone, probably uh, all the uh, publications that uh, were, were put out there in the past uh, months. Uh, one of them is probably not showing it. Uh, to come probably in September, an extended uh, version of CODAR tables, basically just online tables, uh, focusing on more behavioral aspects of giving rather than just the usual rate by sociodemographic. Thank you very much. I hope I was not too long. Thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. It was uh, great to hear about all the different content areas. We do have some uh, questions. Um, first of all, on the, the family, family survey and then some on the giving, volunteering and participation that we could run through. Um, how about we start with the family? Let's, let's actually start with the giving, volunteering and participation because we're there right now and then we'll go back to the family uh, if you're okay with that. And then if there's any other questions, feel free to ask them or type them in the chat. So the first one, could you, I, I, I can, Clem, Clemence, can you read this one, please? I, yeah, thank you. On volunteering, which question? Um, I, I actually, you know, now I, now I look at it and it's actually on the family survey. Uh, okay. I, I can't read the rest of it. I, <laughs> I okay. have two for family survey and one for um, uh, giving and volunteering. So. Okay, well then I'll, I'll ask the first question because it was actually. Yes. Okay, <laughs> the last one is, um, okay, we get a, uh, uh, Will we get a 2018 update on the estimate amount of volunteering value for each activity? Will this be comparable to the 2013 numbers? So, so just explaining the question a little bit before, previously there was, uh, using the survey, there was a table developed for the not-for-profit, uh, the satellite account for not-for-profits and volunteering. 
and they had some activity level breakdowns for 2013. Uh, will there be a 2018 update of that? And uh, how will it compare with the 23 numbers with the, the changes you described? Okay, so, so this is a GVP question. Yes. Um, but, but, uh, very rapidly, uh, yes, we've been in touch with some colleagues from the satellite accounts just uh, very recently and have agreed to, uh, as we do on a regular, uh, well, not that regular, but a, a cyclical base, uh, we will provide that table uh, by activity and probably by organization types. Uh, but um, it is not, the, the second aspect of the question, the compa comparability aspect is not, is not clear uh, right now. Uh, even though we will provide that that table to to our colleagues, um, the the international defi definition of volunteering, as you just uh, understood or learned, is now wider and larger than just the formal component. So I believe that the satellite accounts have also uh, some homework to do on their side and to see how they're going to articulate this change into their own systems. Our job was to be ready to provide our, our best estimate of the rates and, and, and hours per, per these activities. Uh, but right now, there is, it, it, there's a bit of work to be done on, on the conversion of, of, of this definition. Um, there's also another component to the, that comparability. Um, we have observed with the 2018 that offered that EQ option, uh, some differences in, in the answering patterns of certain questions, specifically uh, on the giving side of things. Um, and this is probably due to EQ features that are not completely replacing the support of an interviewer helping you with your recall of all donations in the past 12 months. In so rapidly answered is yes, we'll provide these numbers, uh, but it, it is less clear, but super clear that there is some work to be done to, to do that bridging to that other definition. Perfect, thank you very much. And I'm excited to hear that uh, you, you have shared those and, and we're uh, working to move forward on that. Thank you. Um, could we go to the family survey questions? Yes, uh, uh, the first one is about uh, uh, okay. is data on couples segregated by type of couple like same sex. Yes, uh, with a family survey, we can have data on uh, couple like same sex or differences uh, of uh, the of a partner. And. Uh, Another question is about, uh, okay, okay, par rapport à l'itinérance, uh, que malheureusement avec les données de famille, on n'a pas de l'information en ce qui concerne l'itinérance, donc on ne pourra pas savoir uh, l'impact des politiques uh, en matière d'itinérance sur, sur les familles uh, au Canada, malheureusement. Donc, uh, ouais, je pense que c'est, that's the two questions for family I have in the chat. Uh, Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so if there's no further questions, we will, um, we will post uh, the recordings and everything online as well. Um, Sarah has offered to be a contact person. So if you do have more questions as you look things through or think things through, um, you can email her and then she'll get you in touch with the right person uh, to answer those questions. So uh, I just want to say thanks again for attending. It was a uh, Really great to have you all here, and it was great to have all, all of our guests and um, presenters from Statistics Canada uh, share more about uh, the great work they're doing with the general social statistics data. Great. Thank you very much for having us.